man, we're pumped to have you here. It is end of August, y'all. We about to hit Labor Day. This is flying by. We about to get to Christmas. I actually have a Christmas present for you today. We're gonna, solve, we're gonna I, I, sit tight on that for a second. Um, Man, we're thrilled to have you. If you're brand new, my name's Petey. I'm the lead pastor here. We'd love the chance to get to meet you. Uh, my wife, Brittany, and I will be out in the lobby afterwards, so come say hey. Uh, I got two little things I wanna drop on you real quick uh, before we move on. One is uh, I wanna let you know that two weeks from today, September 12th, we're gonna start our next collection of messages, our next teaching series called Death to Religion. And uh, the concept behind this series is that most people believe, a very commonly held view in our world today, is that religion is actually what's making our world worse. That if our world would just kind of collectively say, death to religion, we're done with it, that the world would actually be a better place, not a worse place. And what's interesting is when you actually dig into the life and the teachings of Jesus, he agrees that Jesus actually came to offer us a much better way than religion ever could. And so this is gonna be a great, great opportunity for you to invite some people to come into the Peak City family. It's a great opportunity to, to spread the word and help people discover who Jesus really is and what he's really all about. So mark that on your calendars, grab some invite cards on your way out today and spread the word about that. That's September 12th, so two weeks from today. Now, I told you I had a Christmas present for you, all right? Um, I wanna revisit just for a second what we did last week, all right? If you were here last week, you know what we talked about. Uh, we had a wild, raucous, rowdy party talking about church finances. See, some of them are like, yeah, they're wooing and cheering church finances. This is great. No, it was actually a really, really good opportunity for us to just as a family kind of talk about where we are as a church and what it's going to take to build the future. Right? We said that progress requires sacrifice. We won't get to where we're going if we don't give like the future needs it. And uh, we just real talked about it. We, we real talked about the fact that we are like most churches in America. It is a constant survival mode where, you know, our, our need barely matches our giving, and that's normal, right? It's a, kind of a scary place to be, but that's just, that's the church world. We, we also talked about how our church is very normal in the sense that like 700 households or so call this place home but only 175 households give, meaning 25% of the people that call this place home do all of the financial giving to support this place. And again, that's just normal, right? And so we talked about how if we're gonna build the future, we gotta push past normal, right? Like we gotta give like the future needs it. We gotta become an abnormal church. And so we laid out this challenge to everybody and we felt like it was a challenge that, you know, some people wouldn't be able to meet and that's okay, but the vast majority of us are able to consider. We asked everyone to pray about giving an additional $100 a month to build the future. And for some people, that's 100 bucks per their home. Some people, it's 100 bucks per person. Some people can afford 100 bucks per every person in their family and their dog and much more. And that's great. But we just said, whatever it is, just go pray about that. And let's try to all pitch in together and build the future. And I want to celebrate with you what happened over the last seven days. Uh, in the past week, we've had 20 brand new families start giving to the mission here at Peak City, which is incredible. That's huge. And on top of that, we had a ton of people, and this is so Peak City, this is so like who this church is, we had a ton of families that already give financially here who were like, oh, I'm giving more, I'm going, I'm going, let's build. And so that's to be celebrated too, faithful financial givers who then go, I can give more, I'm gonna go above and beyond. And so I think we should celebrate them as well, that's huge. And so we took a step in a very good direction uh, over the last week. Still have room to go, still have needs, obviously, um, but, I, I wanna drop something on you today, all right? Ho, 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 it's Christmas in August and September. Um, today, we are, we are uh, the, the plan was all along for us to drop our brand new Peak City Church merch, our brand new T-shirts to you today that say build the future on the back. You know, we got a couple of good designs. You got a brown one and you got a black one. You can throw the slide up there for us, Shauna. You got us, awesome, you'll get us there. Um, there they are, Fa fashionistas modeling this for us. Um, these are, if you saw them, they're out in the lobby. There's like a big display out there with all of them sitting on it. Um, our plan all along was to have these and to sell them for 20 bucks a pop because that's like normal, like these aren't free, obviously they cost money. We're gonna sell them for 20 bucks. And after this last week, we just felt like, man, forget that. Let's just keep the spirit of generosity going. And so we're saying today that for anyone and everyone, they are free. You can have them, all right? And yeah, Christmas, ho, ho, ho. 
Now, the reason behind it is, one, if you started giving over the last seven days or you increased your giving, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, this is a small way. Uh, uh, whenever you, you wear this shirt and you see it says build the future and you're putting that thing on, I want you to know that you are a part. You are actively doing what it takes to build the future. But then for the rest of y'all, even if you didn't start giving or even if you weren't here last week and you're just now learning about it, I want you to take a shirt. And the only thing I'm going to ask of you is I wanna ask that if you take a shirt, I want you to at least have a conversation with God about whether or not you can start helping us build a future here. That's it. Like, I will pay $20 and give you a t-shirt if it means that you'll at least have one conversation with God. All right, so that's the deal. Take a shirt, pray about your giving, and we're gonna build the future together. You ready? All right, awesome. It's like, it's like my Oprah moment. You get a shirt, and you get a shirt, and you, everybody gets a shirt. I had that line ready all week long. <laughs> My Oprah moment. Um, hey, we're in, a, we're in a series right now called Build the Future, funny enough. And we are, um, we're talking about how coming out of pandemic, almost out of pandemic, not quite, but almost, um, we're, we're talking about how God doesn't want us to just recreate the past, but that we have, like God wants us to lift our heads up and build a bigger and a better future. And so we said, man, for all of us in our personal lives, we need to start dreaming again about what God wants for us as we move forward. And we said the same thing as a church. Like we wanna start praying and, and lifting our heads up to what God could build here as we move forward. And we said this big vision that we're praying towards is that we would be debt free and reach 2,500 people for Christ by the end of 2025. Debt free meaning we paid this building off, $6 million worth of debt we will owe on this building. We, we, we wanna pay that off so that we can give away more money than we ever have in our, in our church's history. So that we can serve more people in need in our community than we ever have, so we can serve more people around the world than we ever have. And we wanna, we wanna really, really intentionally pray and invite and share our faith so that we can help 2,500 people come to know Jesus by the end of 2025. It's a big, big vision, and we're laying the groundwork for how to build the future, both in our personal lives and as a church. And the way we're doing it is going through the book of Nehemiah. And so Nehemiah had this big vision to rebuild the city walls of Jerusalem so that every Jewish man, woman, and child scattered across the world would have a home to come back to. And so we're just kind of looking at what he did to build the future, and we're imitating that in our own lives. Now today, uh, the title of my message is Serve Like the Future is Possible. All right, Serve Like the Future is Possible. And I want to I wanna give you a heads up on it. I have had this message stored away in my heart and my mind and my soul for nearly a decade. All right, I, this is one of those that like, when I was a younger guy in ministry, I always prayed, God, if you would ever let me lead a church, this will be a message that I preach on a very regular basis. Um, not only because I think that it's necessary for the church in moving forward, but I think it's necessary for you. I, I, think, I think today's message is kind of the key to life. It's the key to unlocking fulfillment. I mean, so many of us are just trying to find fulfillment and, and, and purpose and meaning to our lives. And I think that if you'll take the heart of God from this message and, and the teachings of Jesus in this message, I think you're gonna see uh, what it means to truly live. And so with that in mind, Nehemiah chapter two, we're gonna start in verse 11. Y'all ready? All right, let's do it. It says, I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. Won't you remember that? He hadn't told a soul yet. If you remember last week, he had this dream of rebuilding the walls. He then told the king of Persia, which was the nationwide ruling powerhouse at the time, and the king had footed the bill. He paid the way for him to go. But he's now in Jerusalem, and he hasn't told anyone there what he's doing yet. He hadn't whispered a word of it yet. I want you to remember that. It says, there were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on, no horses. By night, I went out through the valley gates Toward the, jackal wall, uh, toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there's not enough room for my mount to get through, so I hopped off my horse and I, and I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and I reentered through the valley gate, and the officials did not know where I'd gone or what I was doing, because as yet, I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any others who would be doing the work. Now pause for a minute. Nehemiah has traveled back to Jerusalem. 
He hasn't told anybody yet what he's, what he's gonna do. And first, he decides to set out in the nights. He's with a few people at first. Then it says, actually, it was too small for all the horses to get through. And so he actually hops off and he goes walking by himself to examine the walls that have been torn down and examine the city gates that have been burned down. Nehemiah just needs a minute before this thing gets started. You ever just needed a minute? You ever like, you ever found yourself hiding in a coat closet from your kids? Just me? Cool. You ever like at work, people just driving you crazy and you just gotta like go take a walk, you gotta climb up to the rooftop and just get away for a little bit? Just me? Like you just need a minute. Right, you just need a minute. I need a minute to clear my head. I need a minute to wrap my head and wrap my heart around what I'm doing. See, I think Nehemiah just needed a minute before he embarked on this big journey. And see, what, what I see Nehemiah doing is, is evident when you look at what happens on the other side of this text. In Nehemiah 3, 4, 5, 6, you see a man that is confident and convicted about what God is asking him to do. And so Nehemiah here is saying, hey, before I get into the mess, before I get into the work with her, before I even say, uh, speak a word of what I'm going to do, I'm going to go out by myself with my God and I'm going to have a moment. And I'm going to let him solidify my conviction and let him solidify my confidence before I speak a word about what I'm about to do. And I'm telling you, there's such an important lesson for us to learn here in in our plans to build the future, in our church and in this room, in our personal lives, is that when it comes to your future, when it comes to this dream, this vision you have of what you wanna do going forward, you better be careful who you share it with and when you share it. You better be careful. <laughs> you better be careful about where your confidence and your conviction comes. You, you, you better be careful, because come on, you, you know this. When you let your dream out and you speak it and you share it with somebody, hey, I feel like God's asking me to do this. Hey, I feel like I could maybe do this with my life. Hey, I've got this idea. If you share it with, with the wrong people at the wrong time, you know this. People love, you and I, we love to rain on each other's parades, don't we? we I'm telling you, if it's not my future, <laughs> if it ain't my plans, I'll tell you why it's not going to work. I'll tell you where you're stupid. I'll tell you where you're crazy. I'll tell you where all your risk is. I'll tell you all my history that says you shouldn't do that. That's, that's easy. We love running on each other's parades. We love stepping in and saying why something won't work. Some of y'all don't know this. We almost lost this building because I violated this. We almost weren't sitting here <laughs> because I violated this principle. See, Back up to March, April, 2020, COVID had just began. We were in a different location, different church name, the whole deal. We were in the basement of an old 80s abandoned mall. The vol our, our team did a great job making it look awesome, but it was in the basement of an old 80s mall. It looked like Stranger Things. <laughs> it looked like a different world, right? And we're over there, and, and oh, by the way, that auditorium would have never been able to fit the amount of people we have in the room right now. And oh, by the way, the amount of rent we were paying over there is about the same as what our mortgage is gonna be here. <laughs> but we had one year left on our lease. And th this building was not for sale. There was no, I mean, there was no available place to rent and a pandemic had just hit. So we're trying, like I'm sitting here trying to figure out what are we gonna do a year from now? Our lease ends. And so I sat down, I prayed to God and I felt like God, very clearly said, you do not need to sign that lease. I've got something bigger and better. I had no idea what it was, but I, got, but I, I just knew, I knew, what, I knew in that moment he told me I, I got something bigger and better. But then you know what I did? I did what we all do. I took the dream and I beta tested it on everybody. <laughs> I started picking up the phone and calling people, calling mentors all over the country. Hey, here's the situation, what should we do? Hey, here's the situation, here's what I'm thinking, what should we do? I started calling people in the church. Some of y'all are in the room. I mean, some of y'all people were here and like I called you and said, hey, you're a smart person, you love this church, you've been here for a long time, what should I do, what should I do? And you know what everybody said? All good, God-fearing, God-loving people that love our church and love me, all of them except for one or two said, sign the lease. <laughs> what, are you crazy? <laughs> A pandemic is it, the world is shut down. The last thing you need to do is take a risk. 
sign the lease, stand pat, let the pandemic blow over, and then let's look to build the future. And Josh Wilson, he, he's in here somewhere. Josh Wilson knows we had that lease signed in an email. All we had to do was click send. We were ready. And I got in the shower that day, and it, I swear it was like God me. It, it was like God knew Petey's so stupid. I'm gonna have to like literally stand in front of the tracks and stop him. Like he's so thick skulled. I'm gonna. Ha- and literally in the shower, I mean, I just felt like it was the most overwhelming feeling of like conviction and clarity that God was like, I told you before, don't sign the lease. So don't sign the stupid lease. <laughs> I remember getting out of the shower and going straight to Brittany, and I said, wide eyed, scared to death, I'm not gonna sign the lease. She's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, the church, the building, the, the place, the, the 80s mall, the basement. I'm not signing the lease. She's like, okay. And it didn't make any sense. But I knew what God had asked me to do. And two weeks later, 1710 Dublin Boulevard hit the market for sale. I mean, that, we can clap now because God got in the way of my stupidity. <laughs> But I'm telling y'all, some of you have got dreams that God has given you. Some of you have vision for what you could do with your life. Some of you, like, like God has given you incredible clarity about where you should go. But the reason you've never gone that way, the reason that dream's never gotten off the ground, is because you keep beta testing it on people. You keep looking for your confidence and your conviction to come from man. But that ain't how it works. If you're going to keep beta testing it on people before you take a minute and get alone with God, Say, God, what do you want me to do? I'm going to get my confidence from you. I'm going to get my conviction from you. And then, 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 then I'm going to bring people into the fold. See, that's what Nehemiah did here. He, he got his conviction and his confidence from God. And then he reached out to people and said, here's where we're supposed to go. Look what he says in the next verse. Then, after he had talked to God, after he got alone, it says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. And its gates have been burned with fire. And then here's the most beautiful phrase of chapter 2. Come, let us rebuild. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And we will no longer be in disgrace. And then I told him about the gracious hand of my God and man and what the king had said to me. He said, like, then I told him, like, where my confidence and my conviction comes from. Right? I, I told him that story. But the key phrase there, he says, come, let us build together. You see, that shows you that Nehemiah, in that time that he had alone with God, in that time that he got his confidence and his conviction from God, he also saw something clear as day from God. As he looked at the walls and he looked at the work that had to be done, he saw how crazy it was. He saw how big the project was. See, Nehemiah saw something that you and I have to embrace when it comes to our futures. He saw this truth that the future can't be built alone. Your future, the future you're dreaming of, you cannot build it by yourself. It won't work. Can't do it alone. And that's a problem. That's a big problem. Because you know what I know is that humans, you and me, we loathe, we despise asking for help. If you were to describe humans to aliens, it'd be a hard task. You couldn't find much that we have in common. Y'all are all different. We're all on different sides of issues. We're in the most polarized world today. Everybody's different. One of the only things we got in common is everybody. Young, old, black, brown, white, rich, poor, Democrat, Republican. We all hate to ask for help. And it starts early, y'all. It's not an age thing. It starts early. I took my kids um, to Top Golf a couple weeks ago. How many of y'all have been to our neighborhood freshly opened Top Golf yet? Few of you. It's all right. I get it. Waiting for the crowds to die down. You just need to know, because we have a Top Golf, that means Colorado Springs is like, I mean, it's popping. If a town gets a Top Golf, you know it's about to boom. All right, Top Golf's a big deal. And so I, I take I take my kids to it, thinking this would be great. Because for those of you that don't know, Top Golf is basically golf for people that don't play golf. It's great. It's like everything's like a video game. You hit it, you watch the screen, points that don't make any sense. It's a very random point system. It's fantastic. I take my kids to it thinking this will be great, right? Um, Because how hard can it be? I'm not a golfer. I've never taught them to golf. 
But how hard can it be, right? You just plant your feet, hold the club, keep your head down. Can't be that hard. My kids get the golf club and they hold it like a freaking hockey stick. I'm like, what? Have you ever watched golf? What are you doing? And then like, they don't, they don't plant their feet, they spin, and they fall over. I'm like, what are you doing? And the reason I'm really frustrated about it is because at Top Golf, you don't just buy a bucket of balls, you pay by the minute. It's like 60 bucks for 30 minutes. That's like, is that 50 cents a minute? No, 30 bucks for 60 minutes. That's what it is. I did math earlier today. I was thinking about that way. I was like, what is the total per minute? Huh. 50 cents a minute. But you know, that for me, like as a dad, I'm sitting there watching my kids and they're wasting time. They're lollygagging and every stupid hockey swing, I see two quarters just falling out of my pockets. I'm like, oh, there's two more. Great. Just bleeding money. So I do what any good parent would do. I'm like, hey, can I help you? I'll teach you. And what's their response? No. I'm going to do it on my own. Fine. You try to be Phil Mickelson. See, it. See how far it gets you. But it don't stop with kids, teenagers, students in the room. Y'all know this. What is the last thing that you want from your parents? Advice. Amen. Someone said. <laughs> Advice from parents to a teenager is like nails on a chalkboard. You don't want help, but it don't end when you become a young adult. When you become a young adult and you need something, you don't ask for help. Guess what you do? You ask YouTube. YouTube is, is the real father of all millennials and Gen Zers. <laughs> Fatherhood has been replaced by YouTube.com. It, it just never ends. The older you get, the less likely you are to ever, ever, ever ask for help. And that's a problem because you can't build the future on your own. I mean, you can but only if the future that you're dreaming of is really, really small and insignificant. If the future you're dreaming about is small and ain't gonna matter, yeah, 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 you can build that on your own. But if you did what we said at the beginning of the series, if you went big with the future, if you started dreaming big about what God can do, if you, if you believe that God can do more than you could ever ask for or imagine, if you believe God wants more for you than you want for yourself, and you started dreaming big, you ain't going to build that big future on your own. You will have to ask for help. If you're dreaming about a big future for your marriage, right, if you're like dreaming about a future where you guys love each other just as much, if not more, at the end as you did at the beginning, if you're dreaming of that marriage, it's like a legacy marriage where like your kids and the people around you are blessed by it, like a big vision of your marriage, you will not get there on your own. You're gonna need people in your life that can encourage you, that can pray for you. You're gonna need some 2 a.m. friends that you can call when the crap hits the fan. You're gonna need some couples in front of you who have been down the roads that you're about to go down to say, hey, FYI, watch out for this. You won't be able to do it alone. If, if you've got a, a future you're dreaming of for your health, your physical health, your mental health, you won't get there on your own. You know how I know that? You got to your unhealthy presence on your own. <laughs> you ain't gonna get to your healthy future on your own. You're gonna need counselors, you're gonna need mentors, you're gonna need people to hold you accountable. You're gonna need people to be real with you. You won't be able to do it. This is why just last week I texted a guy. And this has nothing to do with church. This is about me as a man. Because you know, like, when I say I'm dreaming about the future, I ain't just dreaming about Peak City. I'm talking about, like, I'm, I'm also I'm dual purpose. This is about the church. I'm also trying to apply this to my own life. Because like, when I think about my future, I want to be, I want to be a guy who was in ministry for the long haul. I want to, my, my prayers that God lets me pastor here for the next 30 years and see God do incredible things through Peak City. But I want to love people more when I'm done than when I started. And let me tell you, that's a, very, very difficult future. Because people, y'all know this, people never stop giving you a reason to be bitter. People never stop giving you a reason to not like them. And I just want, I want to have a big heart at the end of this thing. I want to love people at the end of this thing. I, I, I don't want to grow old and cold. Like, I, I, I want to, I, I, I'm praying that in my future that I can look back and say that I did not sacrifice my kids on the altar of ministry. I'm praying that my marriage is healthier 
at the end than it is now. And it's really healthy now, but I know ministry has a way of putting people through the ringer. Like, I, I've got those big prayers. So that's why last week I texted a guy who's in his 60s, way further down the road than me. He's been in ministry for 40 years, and he's got the marriage, the family, the ministry, the heart for people that I hope to have. And I said, hey, uh, next summer, you want to go fishing? <laughs> I just need to, like, I don't know, hang out with you on the river. And, like, just like, I just need to know how you did what you did because I know I can't get there on my own. Like, the future, if it's big, you can't build it alone. And so Nehemiah says, come, let us together. Come, let us all come together and build the future. And the people respond in verse 18. They replied, not maybe, not I don't know, let's see. They said, no, let's do it. Let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. And Nehemiah chapter three, I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you, but it is a list of nothing but names and work, names and tasks, names and things that were accomplished by a large group of people coming together and serving like the future was possible. It says, Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and they rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place. As far as the tower of, of, of the hundred, which they dedicated, as far as the tower of Hanel, they went wide on both sides. Then the men of Jericho built the adjoining section and Zakur, son of Emery, built the one next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimoth, son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshulam, son of Bar Barakiah, the son of Meshazavah. I'm doing an amazing job in these names. <laughs> made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, son of Bana, also made repairs. It, it goes on and on. Shauna, go ahead and start clicking through them. Just give them a, a taste of what we're talking about. This is chapter three. Everything's happening behind me. It's names and work. Names and work. Names and tasks. It shows everyone that it took to rebuild this wall. It was person after person after person. And you see in this, I'm telling you, it's everybody. It's every man, woman, and child coming together and building something special. It's people of all backgrounds, all walks of life, all over the spiritual spectrum coming together to build something bigger than themselves. And every person mentioned in chapter three had a place. Every person in chapter three had a place to belong a place to contribute. There were people in there that were like goldsmiths, you read, but they weren't just there building, like doing gold stuff. They were grabbing a shovel and getting to work. There were people there who were political leaders who, trust me, had zero training in anything operational or mechanical. But they said, I'm gonna serve. I'm gonna do whatever it's, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I will lay down my accolades and my success and my skills and I will serve like the future is possible. They all came together. And I know chapters like that are boring to read. Like if you go home and try to read it today, you're probably gonna fall asleep. <laughs> it's gonna be one of those really unholy moments where you're like, I wanna be a good person. I wanna read the Bible. And you're gonna sit down with Nehemiah 3 and you're gonna be, you're gonna be unholy asleep by the end of this thing. But it's just because you don't see, you don't see what's happening. See, when I see Nehemiah 3, I see the church. It's the church. It's every man, woman, and child coming together to build something that's bigger than themselves. It's, it's people of all skills, all different levels of leadership and influence outside these walls coming together and building something special. And everyone has a place. See, Nehemiah 3 is a great list, but let me tell you, Peak City Chapter 3 is a good list too. And, 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 and I wanna give you a small picture of what I mean by that. And I just, we rattled these names off earlier this week. It took us about five minutes and we could go way longer. But I could tell you about Jess, Jared, and Chelsea who do photography and graphic design. Every social media post you see put out, it's done by volunteers. Everything that we share online to help other people see what church is like is done by people serving. I could tell you about Christy who manages our database and helps other people manage our database. She's not paid. She just helps make sure that nobody falls through the cracks. She helps make sure that we all know that when there's someone who maybe checked their kids in several months in a row but then fell off the radar, that we know, hey, they, they might not be doing well. We should check in on them. You know, like that's, that's super important. I, I could say about Alyssa, Sarah, Jared, Andrew, Phil, Josiah, Paul, Sebra, John, Shauna, and Adam, and so many others who come on Wednesday nights and they rehearse. They do all it takes. And I mean, there's a whole team of people in the back room right now 
that are making sure this thing gets broadcasted online to everybody that's watching right now. There are people serving and making sure the lights and the sound and everything, none of them are paid. They just come together and they serve to make sure that everyone has an incredible experience. I could tell you about Corey, Marcus, Dave, Mike, and Bobby, and several others who serve on our safety team. They keep this place safe. And let me tell you, they are inconspicuous. You probably don't even know they're there, but they are dangerous. <laughs> they're some Liam Neeson volunteers, taken style. You, you, I'm telling you, you don't want to mess with them. I can tell you about Frank who gathers people here every Thursday morning at 6.30 to pray for you. Every, every Thursday morning at 6.30 a.m., there are people in this room that are praying for you. There are people walking this building who are praying for you. I can tell you about Rebecca, Penny, Jen, and Jackie who come in and serve 5, 10, 15 hours a week during the week, getting everything ready for Peak City Kids. Everything ready so that your kids and my kids are served and loved and shown Jesus. I could tell you about Kevin, Kira, Kenny, uh, Carrie, several others who serve on Sunday nights. They come back on Sunday nights and serve our teenagers at Peak City Youth. I could tell you about Mark, Jeremy, Seidel, Susan, and Josh who serve in Peak City Kids. They rock babies, they lead kids in worship, they lead small groups. I could tell you about Rob, Lisa, Natalie, Wendy, Josh, Sherwin, Pat who serve on our guest services team and make sure people feel welcome there. Ed, Pam, and Angie and several others lead small groups during the week. I mean, I could just keep going, name after name, work after work, task after task. I'm telling you, it takes a volunteer militia to pull this thing off every week. This church, you know, back in the day, the future we were dreaming of, which we're standing in right now, it wasn't built solo. It was built by a bunch of people coming together, a volunteer militia. And I say that, that word volunteer militia specifically because the phrase that I believe, and I've been saying this for a year, I mean, some of our guys in the crowd that are elders know I've been praying about this and I've been talking to our staff about this for a year, but as we look to the future, it's gonna take not a volunteer militia, it's gonna take a volunteer army to get where God's leading us. It's gonna take all of us coming together and doing what we can, doing what we're good at, doing what we're not good at <laughs> to build this thing, to reach its full potential and see thousands of people come to know Jesus. And you can go to our website, peakcityco.com slash volunteer. That's a good next step for you later this afternoon and just look at all the things, all the ways you can serve. And you might have ways that you could serve that aren't even listed there. That's great, drop us an email. That, that, that's, that's like, that's a great thing for you to browse through, but I'm telling you, it don't matter where you are in your faith. There are people in this room right now who serve every week, who aren't sure what they believe about Jesus just yet. But they have found a home here and they belong here. I'm telling you, every person, there is space for you. There is a seat for you at this table. You are needed. The, the future is possible but we've got to step up and we've got to serve. And what I really wanna do is, like in this moment, this is gonna sound kinda of weird, I wanna let you in on this point. I wanna let you in on a dirty little secret of the 21st century American church, all right? I, I've been in ministry for 15 years. I know that because I got into ministry about six months before my wedding. And we're coming up on 15 years of marriage. So it's an easy, easy result. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I don't know why I just tipped my hat to you on that. <laughs> I looked at my wife and was like, and a good day to you, ma'am. Um, 15 years I've been in ministry and I've done every role. I mean, no kidding. I've done every single role in the church. I've been a kids, kids pastor, get up on stage, dancing and singing with kids. I've been a youth pastor, I've done IT, I've done facilities, I've done production, I've done video, I've done creative design, I've done, all, I've done small groups, I've done every role in ministry. I've even led worship. I'm telling you, you don't wanna see that. You don't wanna hear that. But there was a time when I had a guitar and I was singing, on, I'm telling you, if we ever get to that place, you know Peak City's in a bad way. <laughs> you know the volunteer militia has turned into like a five on five basketball team. <laughs> it's, it's getting rough. But I've seen, I've seen every position. And now I get to serve as a lead pastor. And I'm telling you, in every position at every church, I have seen a dirty little secret of the American church in the 21st century. And it is that the, the church in America has a tendency now and is leaning so heavily in the direction of hire more, serve less. 
hire more, serve less. When the church grows and more people come in the doors and there's more needs and there's more stuff to do, AKA our past six months, the tendency of the church in America is to say, let's hire some professionals, whatever that means, to do the work that could be and should be done by the body of Christ. Hire more, serve less. And that's for a reason, right? There's a reason that church staffs hate asking the congregation to serve because it feels like we're asking you to help us move. You know, come on, if you've had to move and you've had to ask your friends to help you move, you know how bad it is and you know what you do, there's only two key things you include in the sales pitch. You make sure people understand it's not gonna take that much time, right? It'll only take a couple hours, I don't have that much stuff, not that big of a deal. And then the second thing is we'll feed you. We'll give you pizza, we'll give you. It ain't no different in the church world. It's like, hey, could you serve? We, we really need some help, could you serve? I, I promise you it'll only take a little bit of your time and we'll have coffee and donuts. It's the same sales pitch. And it's like, ugh, like nobody, like if you're moving like, and you have the resources to have movers, it's so much better to get movers, right? Oh my gosh, because it's a pain asking people. It's awful because we don't like to ask for help. But then on the other side, the reason that when we do ask for help, when the church does ask for help, the reason that it, the congregation normally responds no is because from the congregation's perspective, it feels like someone asking you to help them move. <laughs> it's the same thing. I mean, come on, when someone asks you to help them move, it's not like, well, I've got all the time in the world in my schedule, sure, my Saturday's free. It's my only day off, no big deal. Yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> hey, no, come on now. Everybody's busy, nobody's got time. Right? And so what happens is we hire more and serve less. And I'm just telling you, if we're gonna build the future, just like we said last week, we can't be a normal church in our giving, we can't be a normal church in our serving. If we're gonna build the future, we've got to reject that tendency to hire more and serve less. And we've got to empower and give away leadership and give away responsibility to the body of Christ and us together, let us come together and build. And, and, and the funny thing is that like the, the whole mentality of serving in the church today, it ain't nothing like what Jesus talked about. See, like we, we, we talk about serving like it only benefits the church. <laughs> and Jesus is like, no, that's not, that's not serving at all. He actually said something very different about serving. If you look in John chapter 13, John 13, th this is right after Jesus had just washed the disciples' feet. A moment of serving. Jesus sat around, one of the last things he did with his closest friends, he sat around, he brought a, some, a, 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 a bowl of water and a towel, and he scrubbed these dirty feet, and he washed them. It was below his pay grade, it was below his influence, and he didn't have time for it. But yet he served, and he washed feet. And, and, and after he's done, look at, look at what he says, it's so fascinating. It says, do you understand, when he finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. You should serve. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you, because very truly I tell you, no servant's greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Jesus is saying, hey, I, I served. And if you're gonna call me Lord, but you ain't gonna serve. No servant's greater than his master. But then he says the key line. Last verse says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You'll be blessed if you serve. It doesn't say you will be exhausted if you do them. It doesn't say that you'll be unhealthy if you do them. It doesn't say you're gonna run out of time in your schedule. If you, it doesn't say that you're gonna be begrudgingly doing, no, 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 it actually says if you'll serve, you will be blessed. See, in a world that preaches, and right now this is such a strong message in our world, the, in a world that preaches you do you, right? Like the, the, the best thing you can do is like really whatever you want to do. <laughs> in a world that preaches what you really need is more me time, Jesus says actually it's more blessed to give than receive. He says, actually, if you want the path to life, you ought to serve. 
See, if we continue to just go like every other church and hire more and serve less and never ask the church to step up and fulfill what God's put in you to do, not only are we short-circuiting the church, we're short-circuiting you and your spiritual growth and your development. We're keeping you away from the opportunity to be blessed, to live life to the full. Because I'm telling you, you were not created to be a consumer. You weren't created to show up to church and just watch it. <laughs> you were created for so much more, man. God wants you to live your life. He wants you to pour your life out in service of a vision and a mission that is greater than yourself. And the church, I'm telling you, yes, the church is God's plan A to rescue the world. I believe that with all my heart. I also believe the church is God's plan A to rescue you from yourself. That you have a path through the church to put your gifts into action. You have a path through the church to serve and to experience life to the full. And in doing so, you actually imitate Jesus. Remember, it's Jesus who said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life away as a ransom for many. I mean, you want to be like Jesus, lay down your life. Lay down your time, lay down your schedule, lay down your gifts, lay it all down and just say, God, I, I will serve you wholeheartedly for the rest of my days. Whatever you ask me to do, I'll do it. I will give my life to serve you and to serve your mission and to serve the church. And so I, 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 I want us to do that together. I think that's like my big prayer for today is like when Nehemiah, when Nehemiah says, come let us rebuild, it's like I wanna look out at all y'all right now and just say, come let us build. Come let us build together. And let's all be a part of, of building something that's bigger than any one of us. And let's see what God can do through us.